Well, good morning, everyone. I'm glad that uh, everyone survived the fire, and uh, especially glad that you all came back to listen to my talk. I'm excited to tell you today about some of the work that we're doing at SFU and at the company Levon mentioned, uh, which is called Photonic, uh, where we're building quantum technologies. So we're interested in building technologies for quantum computers, which some of you may have heard of, and we're in interested in technologies for connecting them together. Uh, in the same way that we connect together regular computers to make the internet, we want to be able to connect quantum computers to make a larger quantum internet. And what I hope to show you today is why we're interested in doing that and how uh, we're planning on doing that with technologies that are being developed uh, here in the Vancouver area. So before I dive into what we're doing specifically, let's first of all establish what a quantum computer is and why we want to build one. So you might be familiar with the fundamental units of information which underpin all classical information technologies. And those are bits. Uh, discrete units of information, they can be on or off. We can describe them as being a one or a zero. And pretty much every computation that you do today just involves the manipulation of those bits. A quantum computer takes that concept and extends it into the realm of quantum physics. Because in quantum physical systems, you don't have to be exclusively in one state or another. You can be in what we call a superposition of both. So if you take a quantum bit, it doesn't have to be just on or off. It doesn't have to be just one or zero. It can exist in a state which is both at once. We call that a qubit superposition. So I've written out the maths for that here. Uh, basically, these little angle brackets just indicate that this is a quantum state. So this is a quantum zero and a quantum one. And here we have a superposition of that quantum zero and quantum one. But you can kind of ignore the maths, and you can think of this in terms of some more common examples you might be familiar with for understanding superpositions. So who here has heard of Schrodinger's cat? Hopefully everyone. But for those of you that haven't, this is a uh, very ancient now uh, quantum uh, thought experiment which was postulating about larger physical systems existing in a quantum state. So in this thought experiment, we have a cat which, due to a connection to a quantum system, uh, is in a state simultaneously of dead and alive. So these qubits are in that same kind of superposition. They're simultaneously 0 and 1 in the same way that Schrodinger's cat is simultaneously dead or alive. And we can write these states, just map to the state of the cat here. Another way of representing a qubit is that we can represent it by an arrow. So a bit might be an arrow pointing up or down for 0 or 1. And a superposition of a quantum bit can be described as an arrow which points at a little bit of an angle. Or another way is to think of them as colors. So a uh, regular light switch and a regular bit can be on or off, but a superposition uh, of a qubit can be varying levels of on and off, and it can also have a color, which corresponds to the angle of that arrow or the relationship between the alive and dead parts of the cat. OK, so that's what we're working with. We take bits, we encode them in quantum systems, we have quantum bits, and they have this funny property that allows them to exist in two states at once. Now, once you've decided to do that, something really crazy happens. And that is that as you start putting more and more of those qubits together, you start to build up a register of qubits. And that register of qubits can be in a superposition of every possible state of that register at once. And this is where we start playing uh, games with exponents. So if you have a qubit, it can be in two states, on and off. If you have n qubits, it can be in two to the n possible states. And it can be in all of those configurations at once. Now, two to the n is a number that gets very, very big very, very fast. So for example, if you have 50 bits, the number of possible states for that register is 10 to the 15. That's larger than the memory of the world's largest supercomputer, Summit. So if you have 50 qubits, it can exist in all of the possible memory configurations of the world's largest supercomputer simultaneously. If you have 300 qubits, well, 2 to the 300 is larger than the number of atoms in the universe. So that quantum computer has more possible states and can exist in all of those possible states simultaneously than there are atoms in the universe. So this scaling factor makes computing with quantum devices, games with qubits, significantly more powerful than what you can do on a classical computer. We can picture how a quantum algorithm works on a register of quantum bits by comparison to a classical computer. So here we have a box which represents the possible registers of a uh, classical of a, of a state of bits. So here we have all of the classical uh, possible states of that register. They exist on a line along the axis of this square. So you can see you start with all of them at zero, you start mixing in some ones, and by the time you get to the end, they're all ones. So this is all of the possible configurations. A classical computing code progresses along this line proceeding from one to another according to an algorithm. 
But if you have a bit of uh, a register of quantum bits, it can exist in this full state, the full space of this square. And that means that when you start playing with quantum algorithms, you can start from a particular classical state, you can expand up to use this full quantum space, and you can come back down to give you the outcome of your measurement. So you can explore all of this space simultaneously. You can think if you wanted to simulate this quantum system on a classical computer, you'd have to explore all of this space one point at a time, the way that a classical algorithm does. What makes a quantum algorithm potentially a lot more powerful is the parallelism of being able to explore this superposition. So expanding out into this space and then coming back down and performing your calculation on all of those possible registers of the qubits in parallel. We can write out an algorithm for a quantum circuit in a way which is very analogous to an algorithm for a classical computer. Uh, we start with a number of qubits which are in some well-defined state. We have gates which might just operate on one qubit at a time or might operate at two qubits at a time. That's like an AND or an OR operation in a uh, traditional computer. And at the end we have measurements that measure the uh, different uh, states of the qubits at the end. Now this is where it gets a little bit subtle. Because we talked about how these quantum computers can be massively parallel. They can explore this large space. But when you do the measurement at the end, well, when you measure it, Schrodinger's cat isn't alive and dead at the same time. It's either alive or dead. So all of those quantum states that we made, this big space that we created, that collapses down to one outcome when we do that measurement. So you might be able to explore a very big space, but you also need to be able to make measurements that sample that space sufficiently. And this is a big catch for quantum computing. Because of this, it isn't the case that every algorithm you can run, every computation you can run, gets sped up by a quantum computer. Your uh, quantum phone, your Q phone, won't be significantly faster than your iPhone for 99.99% of things that you do on an iPhone. But there are particular algorithms which have been developed which do take advantage of this. And uh, to be precise, there are about 60 of them. So of all of the known things that we can uh, imagine doing with a computer, there are about 60 which we've written algorithms where we know that those algorithms will be faster than their best classical counterparts on a quantum computer of sufficient size. And they do all kinds of different things. And there's this really neat website, it's called the Quantum Algorithm Zoo, uh, and you can go to this website and you can read descriptions of every single one of these. So this is a complete list of everything we know to be faster on a quantum computer. Again, if you can build a quantum computer of sufficient size. Very broadly, what kinds of things are in, that, uh, in the space of those algorithms? Well, I've picked out a few highlights here. So one that's very exciting is computational chemistry. Chemistry is fundamentally the study of quantum systems. And as those systems get larger and larger, larger molecules or materials, uh, it gets harder to simulate them exactly on a classical computer. We have lots of classical computational methods for solving those kinds of chemistry problems, but they don't always work for every problem. In particular, problems where you have a lot of electrons that are correlated become very difficult to solve. So there are all kinds of molecules that we don't know how to solve exactly. We don't understand their reactions precisely, we don't understand their energy levels precisely, and there are materials that we don't know how to simulate uh, precisely as well. So a quantum computer allows you to simulate those quantum systems on a computing platform which uses the same kind of complexity as the problem that you're solving. And we've developed techniques, so one of those is called quantum phase estimation, for performing those kinds of calculations. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. What this capability unlocks is advances in different applications of chemistry. So one of those, for example, has to do with making uh, fertilizers more energy efficiently and more cheaply. We currently use a very energy intensive process for making industrial fertilizer, which is called the Haber-Bosch process. Uh, that process is not the best uh, way of creating the ammonia that we need for industrial fertilizer. We actually know that bacteria are able to synthesize ammonia without using the high temperatures and high pressures that the Haber-Bosch process does. So we know that there exists a way of making fertilizer more energy efficiently uh, and more cheaply than we currently do. But we don't understand what it is. We don't understand how it works. And that problem has defied our most advanced classical uh, chem computational chemistry techniques. But that problem is known to be uh, solvable on even a relatively small uh, quantum computer. So that's a breakthrough which simultaneously will uh, make it easier to produce fertilizer, will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and is uh, going to impact a billion dollar industry. Similarly, there are applications in medicine, in drug discovery, and in material design for uh, batteries, for aeronautics. Uh, so, for example, there's a Canadian quantum computing company called Xanadu, which has just started a partnership with Volkswagen, where they're going to be designing batteries for future electric cars. It's hoped, if they can build a large enough quantum computer. 
Another application which is very exciting is secure communication. The um, cryptographic protocols that underlie all of our internet security at the moment, they rely upon assumptions about the kind of computational power that your adversary has. Specifically, uh, the certificates which are standard for uh, your online banking, uh, they use a 30-year window to guarantee security. So they say, we're, this is going to be safe, uh, assuming that someone is, not try someone is trying to hack you with a computer that won't exist for the next 30 years. But that's an assumption. That's an assumption about the kind of computing power that people have, and it doesn't guarantee unconditional security indefinitely. But techniques using quantum communication on quantum networks, where you distribute quantum bits between parties instead of regular bits, are known to be guaranteed secure. You can demonstrate that an eavesdropper will never be able to access that information because it fundamentally changes the quantum state. Basically, you're trying to ship Schrodinger's cat from one person to another, and if anyone has intercepted that cat on the way, they open the box, that cat becomes dead or alive, instead of dead and alive, and you no longer have a quantum communication channel, and you can tell that. So you can guarantee that no one has looked at your information while you were shipping it. Uh, and you can do that optically. You don't actually have to ship a cat. Uh, you get a better ping rate than that. Uh, and the final application that I want to talk about today is cryptography. Uh, because this is one of the very first useful applications of a quantum algorithm. Uh, the idea of quantum computing was first proposed in the 80s. Uh, it took about a decade before people started writing actual algorithms that you could run, and it took about uh, another four years from the first algorithm being proposed to the first useful algorithm being proposed. And that was Shaw's algorithm for factoring large numbers. And the reason that that uh, was recognized as very significant is that it is the difficulty of factoring large numbers which underlies uh, in current internet security protocols, what's called RSA. So uh, it was immediately realized that someone with a quantum computer would be able to perform the calculations that allow you to decrypt online communications. So even in 1994, when this was first proposed, that was recognized to be a big deal. Today, that's an even bigger deal. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, there are many, many different applications of quantum computing. Uh, and I do want to emphasize that those are only the applications that we know of right now. When people first started building classical computers, they did not even begin to imagine what we'd be using them for today. No one envisioned the internet uh, in, you know, in, in people working Bell Labs, putting the transistor together for the first time. I mean, they didn't even really envision computers. When people were building their very first transistors, they were excited about applications like hearing aids and radios, which are great applications. But those technologies went on to do really world-changing things that the people working on them did not have the imagination to envision. And we're in a similar state today. Even though we've been working on this for about uh, 30 years now, trying to come up with different quantum algorithms, I don't think we're going to see the full space of what we can do explored until we start building the computers to try them out. It's uh, once we have the technologies that we really find out what we can do with them. So we know there are, there are some exciting things. Uh, there's going to be a lot more. I think we're looking at the very top of the iceberg of what you can do with a quantum computer. OK. So I've mentioned a couple of times that you have to build a quantum computer of sufficient size to realize these algorithms. That's just one of the things that you have to do. The long-term goal of quantum technology is to build a universal, a fault-tolerant quantum computer with a scale sufficient to outperform a classical su supercomputer, uh, what we call quantum advantage. And I'm going to break this down and go through each of these in turn. So first of all, what does universal mean? Universal tells you what your quantum computer can do. We're used to taking this for granted. Every classical computer does the exact same thing as every other classical computer on some level. You can run Doom on almost anything. We want a quantum computer which is similar. We want it to be able to do the full list of algorithms that I had up on the uh, quantum zoo earlier. So a universal quantum computer is general. It can be programmed to solve any problem that any quantum computer can solve. And the way that we think about that in uh, you know, the um, uh, quantum information field is in terms of complexity classes, which is shown on this Venn diagram. So we can think of a space, which we call P, which contains all of the tractable classical algorithms. So anything that your uh, classical computer can do efficiently is in this box. We have a space of things that a quantum computer can do that a classical computer can't, called DQC1. And we have a slightly larger space, uh, which is all of the space of uh, tractable quantum algorithms that a universal computer can do. So the point here is that if you've heard a little bit about quantum computing recently, people might not be talking about the same kind of quantum computer. There are lots of computers in this space which are not universal. Uh, so for example, uh, you might have heard about a company called D-Wave, which is local, which does something called quantum annealing, which is not universal. And you might have heard about some techniques uh, called boson sampling, and I'm going to mention them again later. Uh, those are also not universal. 
So even though there are lots of interesting things that we can do with quantum computers that are not universal, the ultimate goal is a universal quantum computer. All right, the next thing we need is fault tolerance. We need to be able to scale these systems indefinitely, and we need to be able to correct errors as they occur. This is something, again, that we take for granted with classical computers. If you have classical bits, uh, it's very easy to do uh, error correction. You can just have, in the simplest possible algorithm, say you've got three bits, and one of them has an error, so it flips, and it goes from one to zero. You can just ask all of those three bits what the vote should be, and you go with the majority. You can reject your minority report. That's a very easy type of uh, error correction, which unfortunately you cannot do on a quantum computer. And that is because you cannot ask your qubits whether they are alive or dead. As soon as you ask them that, you have destroyed the qubit. So you can't do this kind of error correction. So for the longest time, people thought that this killed the concept of quantum computing. Because if you can't com combat your errors, then they're going to uh, propagate exponentially as you do your computation. And you're ultimately going to uh, corrupt the outcome of that computation. In particular, this matters for quantum systems because those qubits are very, very fragile. Any interaction with the environment tends to destroy them. So you have to come up with a way of protecting those qubits uh, so that they preserve their quantumness, and you have to find a way of protecting them from errors. And luckily, we do have some algorithms for quantum uh, fault tolerance and quantum error correction which make that possible which I won't go into in detail, but you do need to be able to achieve this, and there are thresholds over which those become feasible. Okay, next, and uh, quite important, how big can your calculation be? If you have a quantum computer of 10 qubits, that is not big enough to outperform a supercomputer by the argument that we made at the beginning. So if you have a small number of qubits, your computer is not very interesting. Similarly, if you can only do one or two AND gates on your computer before it collapses into its dead or alive state, then uh, you don't have a very interesting computer either. You need to both have a large number of qubits and be able to do a large number of gates. And we call the product of those things the quantum volume. If you have a large enough quantum volume, maybe you can do something interesting. And as you can see, we've been approaching the threshold of where things start to get interesting in recent years. Uh, that 50 qubit level where you start to be able to uh, store states larger than supercomputers, we've crossed over that threshold in 2018, and people have started doing some kind of interesting things with it. So you might have heard that in 2019, Google demonstrated what they called quantum supremacy and what I called quantum advantage, which is they did something on a quantum computer that a classical computer could not do, a classical supercomputer. So they demonstrated a calculation uh, which they estimated that Summit, the world's largest supercomputer, uh, would take hundreds if not hundreds of thousands of years to compute. And it took them about two minutes. That was really exciting. Uh, the only problem is that that calculation is completely useless. Uh, it was a completely contrived, pointless calculation that no one would ever ask you to do unless you had built this exact uh, quantum computer and you wanted to show it off. Nevertheless, that is a landmark achievement. Up until this point, no one had ever done anything on a quantum computer that you couldn't simulate uh, efficiently on a classical computer. Uh, even, if you, even if it did take a supercomputer to beat your quantum computer, you could still do it. You could buy time on Summit, and that may or may not be easier than building your quantum computer. So this is what their quantum computer looked like. Mostly here we're looking at a giant fridge. Uh, that's because this, uh, supercomputer, this quantum computer needs to be very cold, uh, which is going to be a recurring theme, because uh, one way of protecting your qubits from the environment and keeping them in their quantum state is cooling them down to basically absolute zero. So getting to uh, below one Kelvin into the millikelvin regime. Uh, in 2020, a Chinese group also demonstrated quantum supremacy. They did this using an optical quantum computer. So what we're looking at here are a bunch of mirrors and lenses that are bouncing a laser around uh, onto some detectors. And they basically built a uh, fixed quantum computer that can't be reprogrammed. Uh, but it, again, it does something that you can't simulate very easily. Uh, and more recently, uh, Canadian company Xanadu uh, demonstrated the same kind of computation with uh, optical qubits. Uh, but they did it in a programmable way. So we're seeing advances now in this space come really, really rapidly. But still, none of these are doing anything uh, of use, nothing practical. And uh, these examples here are not even demonstrating a universal quantum platform. This is what's called uh, Gaussian boson sampling, which is a very specific type of quantum uh, calculation, which is difficult to simulate, but is not known to be useful for anything in particular. OK, so how far are we today from quantum advantage at a useful task. 
Let's uh, take a look at two things really quickly. So one application I talked about was factoring with Shaw's algorithm, which requires a universal fault-tolerant computer to do at scale. Uh, another thing I talked about was simulations for quantum chemistry. And potentially, this can be done even without fault tolerance. So factoring with Shaw's algorithm. I showed you a generic quantum circuit earlier. Well, this is a specific one. This is the instruction set for what to do to factor the number 15 on a quantum computer. And my old team did this in 2012, and we were very proud of it. Uh, this was an exciting calculation to do at the time. Uh, we factored the number 15, and we got the answers 5 and 3. And then we checked that on a calculator, and that's correct. So we were very, very happy. So this is a relatively simple, uh, quantum, this is a relatively simple circuit to run. Uh, but if you want to factor a larger number, well, how many qubits does it take? That one took us 12. Uh, if you want to, say, factor a 1,000-bit number, uh, which is still a little bit smaller than what you use for communicating with your bank today, uh, then that's going to take about 1,000 qubits. And there's a little bit of a catch here, because this is going to take so many operations that you need fault tolerance. And the way that we get fault tolerance, just like for a classical system, is we duplicate the information across lots and lots of different qubits. Now, maybe we can't do a, ma a, a majority vote system, but we still need to spread that information out across lots of different systems so the errors don't propagate. So there's an overhead. For each logical qubit you, you need, you have to have some number of physical qubits to encode that fault-tolerant logical qubit. And that number can be very large. So here's a calculation from this paper down here uh, where they considered what it would actually take to factor the number uh, of a 1,000-bit uh, number on a uh, architecture which is very common today. This is Google's architecture. And they came up with about 6.3 million physical qubits. OK, so it's a little bit more than we did in 2012. Uh, that's a seriously demanding challenge. The quantum computers that we looked at earlier, where they're getting to the hundreds of qubits, are very, very far from this kind of capability. But what about chemistry? Well, chemistry can be a little bit easier. Uh, so that nitrogen problem that I talked about earlier for making industrial fertilizer, some pe very smart people have done some calculations there and calculated that that will take about 1,000 qubits or 2,000 fault-tolerant qubits. Uh, it'll take you months of computation time. Uh, that's not too bad. So it, when you're in the ballpark of 2,000, a little bit larger uh, logical qubits, then you can start doing some of these really uh, interesting quantum chemistry problems. And there are also some techniques, I've just highlighted one here, uh, that allow you to speed up those kinds of chemistry problems, even without fault tolerance, by using a kind of hybrid classical quantum computer. And we're not really sure how well those work, but lots of people are getting excited about them, uh, and they may have some breakthroughs in the future. OK, so if you want to build a quantum computer, what are the platforms that are available to build one today? Uh, there are about a dozen. We're in a uh, space race for quantum computing. Everyone knows what you can do with a quantum computer. Everyone knows what it takes to build one. But no one agrees on exactly what the best way to build one is going to be. And people are trying very, very different things. If you've ever seen uh, footage of old aircraft before people had really mastered human flight, and they were trying all kinds of wacky designs, that is the era that we're in for quantum computing right now. In hindsight, some of what we're working on today is going to look really wacky. But that is because we don't know what's going to work yet. So people have made a bunch of different bets. There are billions of dollars of investment in this field now as uh, different companies get into uh, their preferred technology for trying to build quantum computers. So there are dozens, and I've highlighted four here. One of the most common, uh, and it's attracting a lot of investment, is superconducting quantum computing. And these are basically microelectronic circuits. They're very similar to the microelectronic circuits that you have in your phone and your laptop, except that we've cooled them right down to fractions of a degree Kelvin. So these are amongst the coldest things in the universe. When those circuits get very cold, they start to behave in a quantum way, and you can change your bits into qubits. Uh, these have the highest qubit count of any existing technologies, which is 127. Uh, they have very short coherence times. They don't stay quantum very long, unfortunately. Uh, they they have what's called nearest neighbor coupling, so your qubits are only connected uh, to their nearest neighbors, to the ones next to them. They're also quite large. So we had a look at that fridge earlier uh, that Google was showing for their quantum computer. Uh, the actual chip in that that contained about 127 qubits is a few centimeters across. So at the moment, their footprint is uh, about uh, a few centimeters to have hundreds of qubits. So they're quite big. When you want to get up to millions, that's going to be a bit of a problem. Another one that's very popular is trapped ions. So these are atoms which have been trapped in a vacuum, so you can isolate them. So each dot in this picture is a single atom. And this is the kind of platform that I used to work with uh, that we demonstrated that Shaw's algorithm on. So if you have 12 atoms in a row like this, you can use them to factor the number 15. At the moment, it's believed to be very difficult to scale this uh, 
very far. So the largest uh, ion trap quantum computer only has about 27 qubits. There are lots of different techniques people are excited about for building a larger ion trap quantum computer, but they seem very challenging. Uh, the next most popular is photonics. That Canadian company Xanadu that I talked about, they're doing a kind of optical quantum computing. And the reason that photonics is really exciting for quantum computing is that photons, uh, the um, fundamental unit of light, uh, they do not interact much with their environment. So if you encode a quantum bit onto a photon, it can propagate throughout space, it can go through an optical fiber, you can send it around the world, uh, and it's still going to have that quantum state when you check back in with it. So light is a really, really good way of transmitting quantum information. The unfortunate thing is that those photons don't stay in one place. It's actually quite hard to do a computation on them because they don't have memory. They just zip around and you can put them in a fiber and you can get them out sometime later. But what you need to do a computation is something that's more like a uh, uh, stationary qubit that you can manipulate uh, and program your gates onto. Uh, and the next one I want to talk about are quantum dots and spin qubits. So these are tiny little defects or uh, microelectronic gates defined on semiconductors. And they trap single particles and those single particles encode a spin. So you might have heard that an electron, for example, has spin. It can be spin up or spin down. That's another quantum state that we can use to encode a qubit. Currently, there are very few qubits in these kinds of computers, uh, and they have variable coherence times depending on the platform, but they are very, very small. So in terms of miniaturization and scaling up to a decent-sized quantum computer, they're quite promising. So I mentioned that there's a lot of different investment in this space, uh, and it's only accelerating. So as we mentioned, Google is uh, looking into superconducting quantum computing. So is IBM, a local company called D-Wave, uh, as well as some others, Rigetti, Nord. Uh, there are big names in quantum dots and spin qubits, including Intel. Uh, so there are probably by now hundreds of companies in the quantum computing space. Uh, and they are all developing different techniques for building up this quantum computer. The one that I want to talk about for the rest of today is our approach. Uh, so this is how we're planning to build the quantum internet. Our approach is a hybrid. And there aren't a lot of people in this space. Uh, it's basically just us at the moment. And we're combining the advantages of photonic quantum computing and spin quantum computing. Basically, we want to take those photons, which are really good at transferring information, just like the internet, uh, and connect them to spin qubits, which are really good at storing that information. And by combining those two, we think we can build up a scalable architecture that allows you to build a quantum computer and ultimately the quantum internet. So what does that look like? Well, a quantum network you can represent as something like this, where you have these nodes, and these nodes contain quantum memory, uh, and you have connections between these nodes that allow people to communicate. So uh, you need that memory to be reasonably long so that you can do a computation, uh, and you need some way of sending photons between them so that you can carry that information uh, between your nodes. These can be different scales. So these two parties at the end of this link, they could be on other sides of the world being connected by a satellite, or they could be uh, different uh, memories on the same chip. So you could have a quantum network on chip, which connects to a quantum network between countries, and that's your quantum internet. And being able to scale up your system of that size uh, is a really powerful thing to do, because every additional qubit that you can add to your system doubles the power of that quantum computer. That means that if you are uh, two people that each have a 50 qubit quantum computer, if you can connect them together and start coordinating their processing power, you've dramatically increased the combined power. So the uh, capabilities of processes networked on a quantum internet dramatically outpace what you can do on those processes locally. They are much more than the sum of their parts once you start connecting them together in a network like this. But if you want to build a network like this, you need a very particular type of quantum system. You need something that not only has a good quantum memory, can hold its quantum state for a long time, you need something that has this optical interface. And those are pretty rare. Particularly, you need something that has an optical interface that operates at a telecom communication band, so that you can send those photons losslessly through optical fiber. If you can't do that, then you lose too many of them, uh, and you don't reach the uh, thresholds that you need in order to do fault-tolerant communication or fault-tolerant computation. So you necessarily need something with this kind of quantum memory. You ideally need something with a um, photon interface in the telecom band. And realistically, you want your system to be on some kind of solid state system which has uh, advanced commercial and industrial fabrication capabilities. One platform that we think is very exciting is silicon. And that's because silicon is already the platform for the microelectronics industry that makes classical computing uh, possible. So if you can use this platform for building your quantum computer, you can take advantage of all of that microelectronic capability that exists. 
And not just microelectronics, there's also the advanced silicon photonics industry, where you can guide light in structures which have been etched onto a silicon layer, uh, and you can switch that light between different paths, you can detect it, you can modulate it. Basically, you can do everything that we saw on those optical tables earlier, and you can put all of that onto a single chip. Uh, so this is an amazing capability, and combined with the microelectronic capabilities of silicon makes this a very appealing platform for building technologies. We're very lucky that not only does silicon have these uh, cap fabrication capabilities, it's also an excellent quantum host. So we talked earlier about how quantum memory is very important, how you need to be able to keep your quantum state. Well, some of the longest lived quantum objects that have ever been measured were defects in silicon, spins in silicon. Uh, so I've got a few different things here. Uh, this is just being measured on a log scale, uh, showing the coherence time, how long they stayed roughly quantum, versus how many operations that you could do on that quantum system. So you can see you can get up to billions of operations on things that last for minutes to hours in silicon. So you can build very, very long-lived quantum systems in silicon. So it looks like this is a platform that might be able to do what we need in order to build a quantum internet and in order to scale quantum processes. But if you want to uh, build those, you need to find a long-lived spin that has those telecom optical transitions. And up until very recently, people did not believe this existed. We started looking into a uh, type of defect in silicon, which is called the silicon color center. We started looking into these in about 2017. We were going back through very old uh, works from the 70s and 80s and 90s, when people had most recently been exploring defects in silicon. And this work uh, was mostly motivated by people building microelectronics. Uh, in particular, when people started sending microelectronics into space, they wanted to know how those circuits would hold up once they started getting bombarded by cosmic radiation. And after that, people basically forgot about it. So now that we were interested in quantum technologies, we came back to these and we started looking into them. Uh, but what are these silicon color centers? Well, uh, they're deflects in the silicon lattice. So this picture here is a picture of the silicon lattice. Uh, each one of these black orbs is a silicon atom, and they're connected by bonds in the following way. And if you irradiate that sample, you might displace one of these silicon atoms, and it leaves you with what we call a vacancy, just a gap in the lattice. And that's a defect. Uh, you might also have an um, impurity in your lattice. You could have one of those displaced silicon atoms move over here, or you could have a chemical impurity uh, which can sit inside your lattice like this. Uh, and those chemical impurities can form molecules. So you can have basically a molecule, molecule embedded in your silicon lattice, and that can host a spin. We started looking at these color centers, and we found uh, a few of them that seemed very interesting. So here we're showing a spectrum of silicon uh, with various different uh, defect centers that are shown by vertical lines on this figure. Basically, each one of these is light which is getting emitted from a uh, particular silicon defect. And here I've highlighted the C, G, and W centers. These are the names that they were given in the 80s. Uh, and they were just given alphabetic names, C, G, and W, because people didn't know exactly what they were. But we started studying them and putting some things together, and we've managed to identify exactly what these centers look like. But the one I want to talk to you about today is the T center. So the T center looks like this. It's two carbon atoms and a hydrogen atom inside the silicon lattice. It has uh, emission at 1326 nanometers, which is in the most common uh, data center telecommunications band. So this is a very appealing wavelength to operate at for communications. So the T-Center is kind of interesting because it is capable of emitting photons where we want them, but it also has an unpaired electron associated with this defect. And that electron can be in those two spin states, up or down, so we can use it to encode a qubit. In addition to that, it also has a nuclear spin, a proton, uh, associated with this hydrogen atom, uh, and that proton has a spin as well. It can be up or down. So we've got these two qubits associated with the T-center, and we can use them together to make a quantum memory, which can be networked using this optical transition. It comes in 24 different orientations in the silicon lattice, and that means that when we apply a magnetic field and we look at that uh, emission line at 1326 nanometers, we see that it splits into all of these different lines. What we're seeing here are spin-selective optical transitions for each one of those orientations. So different subsets of these lines, like A11, C11, B11, D11, they talk to one orientation of center, uh, and each one of these transitions addresses a different spin state. So by diving these different transitions, you can prepare the spin up, so your quantum bit zero, or you can prepare spin down, your quantum bit one, uh, and you can uh, use these optical transitions as well to manipulate those qubits. 
We measured the coherence time of those qubits on the T-center and found that it's very long, so the electron can stay in this quantum state for about 2.1 milliseconds, and the nuclear spin can stay in this quantum state for about 1.1 seconds. This is very long uh, compared to some of those technologies that we looked at earlier, which means it's going to be very promising for building quantum technologies. Because it also has those two qubits per site, you can operate it in a very interesting way. You can use one of your qubits to store information and another one to talk to remote qubits. So this kind of combination of two spins per center is perfect for the kind of quantum networking that we want to do. Uh, you can allocate these tasks. You can call one your broker and one your client. And by working together, they can distribute quantum information and do local computations. So the T-Center looks pretty exciting. But if you want to build devices out of it, you have to start putting it into a silicon platform which is device compatible. You have to start building this up to the scales that we need. And that's what we started doing very recently. So we came up with an implant recipe for preparing T-centers on silicon photonic chips. Basically, we implant carbon, we heat it up, we implant hydrogen, then we heat it up again. And that forms the T-center by a chemical process uh, that involves migrating carbon and hydrogen together into the defect site. And that allows us to put T-centers on chip, which can be photonically patterned, so that we can take advantage of all of that capability for integrated silicon photonics and start building up on-chip networks. In order to start measuring uh, those systems, uh, we wanted to use a technique called uh, microscopy. Uh, basically, if you want to isolate a single center and start controlling it, one of the easiest ways to do it is to put it at the focus of a microscope. So we built up a confocal microscope to measure these centers. Uh, and that's a little bit challenging in silicon, because silicon is very good at holding its light. So not only did we build the microscope, we also patterned some photonics. And we started with possibly the simplest photonic uh, device that you could come up with, a circle. We call these micropucks uh, because they're roughly the same dimensions as a hockey puck, except about 100,000 times smaller. Uh, and these little disks of silicon, if they have a T-center in the center, they direct the light from that center up into our microscope. Uh, and they enhance the emission upwards by about a factor of 20 to 50. We asked a uh, graphic designer to render what he thought that looked like. And this is what he came up with. But basically, on our chip, we have these arrays of micropucks, like this, with T-centers at the center and they emit their light upwards into our microscope. And when we scan our microscope over an actual chip, we get an image that looks like this. Uh, we could have patterned anything here, uh, so we went ahead and patterned the SFU logo. Uh, and each little bit of light coming out of here is a group of T-centers emitting their light into our microscope. When we scan over the pucks, we see each puck is a bright spot. And if we park at a single puck, we can measure a mission that corresponds to single centers. So these are now single T centers at the focus of our microscope, which allow us to measure the spins of that system and to start doing quantum operations. The next step is to start integrating them into devices that are networked. So we have devices on a silicon chip like this. So I hope you can see on this video, we've got these little lines moving underneath uh, this fiber array here. Those lines are our on-chip devices. And what we're doing is we're taking light from an optical fiber and we're passing it down through optical fibers onto the very tip of this block of glass that you can see here. So the light from those fibers comes out of this glass and it comes onto the chip and it's coupled into these devices through little Bragg gratings, uh, little arrays that, refract, uh, that diffract light uh, onto that chip. By measuring T-centers in these devices, we've demonstrated uh, good coherence times and good memory times uh, in these uh, integrated devices. Uh, and we're now looking at uh, demonstrating T-centers inside optical resonators that increase the strength of the interaction between the qubits and the traveling fields. And the reason to do that is by increasing that strength, we can start doing uh, direct transfer of information from the local qubit to the traveling qubit and start building up those quantum networks. So, I'll leave it there. Uh, we've demonstrated that the T-Center has long coherence times, that it operates at a really appealing um, uh, telecommunications band. We've demonstrated it can be integrated with the kind of silicon photonics that you need in order to build quantum networks. So this looks like a very uh, technologically advantageous way to start building quantum computers and ultimately networking together to form this quantum internet. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I welcome any questions.